evening, everyone. We're going to get started if you want to find a seat. Welcome to the Jewish Museum. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Jenna Weiss. I'm the manager of public programs, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's dialogue and discourse, Meat, Fish, and Flowers, featuring artists Angela Dufresne, Josephine Halverson, and Judith Lanares, moderated by John Yao. This program has been funded by a generous endowment from the Saul and Harriet M. Rothkoff Family Foundation, and we thank Harriet, Rhoda, and Nolan Rothkoff for joining us this evening. Thank you again for your generous support of the museum's public programming. Tonight's event is held in conjunction with the exhibition Chaim Soutin Flesh, which recently opened on the first floor and is on view through September 16th. So if you didn't have a chance to see it tonight, please come back and do so. We have a number of upcoming talks and performances in conjunction with the show. Uh, and for information about all of our upcoming public programs, please visit our website to sign up for our e-news. Now I would like to introduce this evening's speakers, beginning with moderator John Yao. John Yao has published over 50 books of poetry, fiction, and criticism. His latest poetry publications include Bijou in the Dark, published by uh, Letter Machine Editions, and the chapbook Egyptian Sonnets. His most recent monographs are of Catherine Murphy and Richard Archwager, Into the Desert. Yao was the arts editor for the Brooklyn Rail for a number of years before he began writing regularly for Hypoallergic. In addition, he serves as professor of critical studies at the Mason Gross School of the Arts at Rutgers University. Judith Lanares is known for her exuberant and gestural colorful narrative images representing figures, animals, and sometimes vases of flowers. After being included in the groundbreaking show Bad Painting in 1978, Lanares moved from California to New York, where she has since lived and worked. Lanares has received numerous grants, including the Solomon Guggenheim Fellowship, Joan Mitchell Grant, and three national endowment grants, most recently the Artist Legacy Award in 2017. Her most recent shows include The Way She Goes to Town at Various Small Fires in Los Angeles and Out of My Head at Anglim Gilbert Gallery in San Francisco. Linares is currently represented by PPOW and will have a solo show at the gallery in 2019. Angela Dufresne is a painter whose work articulates non-paranoid, porous ways of being in a world fraught by fear, power, and possession. She has exhibited at many museums, including the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, MoMA PS1, the Kemper Museum in Kansas City, the Cleveland Institute of Art, and the Rose Museum in Waltham, Massachusetts. Honors and awards include a 2016 Guggenheim Fellowship, a residency at Yaddo, a Purchase Award at the National Academy of Arts and Letters, two fellowships from the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, and a Jerome Foundation Fellowship. Dufresne is currently Associate Professor of Painting at RISD. And Josephine Halverson makes art from observation in relation to a particular object and place. Transcribing her perceptions in real time, she connects with the world around her through the medium of paint. Halverson has been the recipient of several awards and artist residencies, including a Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Award, a New York Foundation for the Arts Award in Painting, and a Sharp Walentis Space Program Residency. Her work is represented by Sykema Jenkins in New York and Peter Freeman in Paris. Halverson has taught at the Cooper Union, Princeton University, the University of Tennessee, and Columbia University. And from 2010 to 2016, she served as senior critic at the Yale School of Arts MFA program. In 2016, Halverson joined Boston University as professor of art and chair of graduate studies. And this summer, she will be resident faculty at the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. I wanted to take a moment to thank each of you for agreeing to participate in tonight's discussion and to say how great it is to see so many artists and friends in the audience tonight. If everyone can take a moment to please silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming John Yao, Judith Lanares, Angela Dufresne, and Josephine Halverson. First person to 
to present her work will be uh, Judith Lanier's. Then I believe it's, who's second? Angela Dufresne, and then obviously Josephine Halverson. And then I'm gonna uh, start the discussion. They're gonna do all the talking, I'm just gonna throw out a few questions. Okay, go ahead, Judy. Okay. <laughs> oh, Pictures. <laughs> oh, okay. Hmm. okay. Magic button. Huh. Not that magic. Nope. <laughs> Here we go. Hmm. This is the black period? Yes. This is in her ad right now. Uh oh. I think I. <laughs> all right. I've pushed all the buttons. Um, <laughs> this is the one to the right. This one? Yes. Keep um, going. Keep going. Okay. See? It goes okay, forward. we're just having Yay. a review here of Soutine. Oh, ah, look. You're there mean. we go. <laughs> we're getting warm. Okay. <laughs> Still lives. Uh, this is a fairly recent painting, um, 2017. Um, these um, flowers started out as real flowers in my studio at one point, but um, once they arrive, they get uh, elaborated on and erased and sanded down and repainted. Uh, and I think of the flowers as well, originally I started um, painting flowers because it was so, such a square thing to do, basically. And it was such a girly thing to do. And I thought, well, I can add rigor and energy to this uh, subject. And uh, I'm working this painting very much like uh, an abstract painting where I'm introducing the forms and I'm taking them out and then I'm reintroducing something else and I'm working with the um, so-called background and the object simultaneously. This is a real red kerchief and I'm reviewing some of the objects and what it is for me to paint from life. And I chose this, I, I've often chose chosen textiles that have uh, a kind of history and have nothing to do with taste. And uh, there's something about sitting still and conjuring all your uh, abilities to render something in all its detail and also have a certain level of clarity with paint. And here is the result of that sort of sitting in there. And this is really what attracted me uh, in the, uh, for uh, actually years and years was still life. It's something, it's kind of like a hobby in a funny way. Something that I return to and it gives me a chance really to sit still and to concentrate and to analyze form. Now, um, basically, I think of myself as a figure painter. And I uh, realized, preparing for this um, presentation, that still life actually looms very large in my imagination. And I, was, I have a book with this Soutine painting on the cover, and I never thought of it as a body or a figure before. And then I arrived with a couple of friends to look at the show, and we both kind of s thought it was hilarious that these inanimate objects have been transformed into something like a body. And I've always thought the forks in Soutine's painting were suspiciously animated. And here, <laughs> they really are. They're gra grabbing at those sardines. This is a still life object. And um, I never really thought of this as a still life object. And, and still I, I started thinking, well, what really is a still life for me? 
So this is a, a toy um, that I found at an actual flea market, which um, seems to be scarcer and scarcer, real flea markets. And this is the painting. <laughs> <laughs> So um, this surprising transition from still life to something that really has figures uh, is something that I feel like is somewhere in uh, Soutine's uh, imagination and, and longing. This, of course, is also a freighted kind of uh, textile. Everybody has one. You see them at the Goodwill all the time. Uh, they're, they're, they really don't represent good taste. They kind of <laughs> represent bad taste. And um, they uh, often, the big figure paintings, this is like a large painting, uh, six by five. They start out with the textile, and there's something about establishing a place with something from reality that allows me to invent the figures around that object. Oops. OK. I have a collection of um, tablecloths from the 30s and 40s. and. Um, I guess I just like how idealized they are and how colorful and how full of hope and uh, how they represent uh, the sort of uh, 50s idea of the good life. And uh, I started with the tablecloth in this case. And this is uh, large, like the tablecloth. Uh, the, the painting is nearly seven feet um, by six feet. And often I incorporate uh, still life in the painting. It's like the chocolate cake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With the slice out of it. Yes, where did it go? <laughs> OK. Uh, this was an actual dinner that I went to. This is a Slovenian lunch. <laughs> and uh, this is a souvenir, another one of my still life objects that my mother collected on a trip to, I believe, Finland. And it represents a folk hero, a kind of witch. She used to be green and kind of looks like my mother. <laughs> <laughs> and that really looks like my mother. <laughs> Uh, this is a recently <coughs> acquired uh, apron uh, made by the Zapotecs in uh, the area outside of Oaxaca. And it, again, it's, it, it's an aesthetic of a sort that has to do with bad taste and it has to do with maybe over decorating. Um, <laughs> and that's the painting which is also animated. I think that there's something in the process for me that is taking something that's not alive and transforming it, like Frankenstein, um, into something that is alive. And I think a lot of Soutine's animals um, really conjure a figure. Um, this, when I first looked at it, I thought of a crucifix. I, maybe it's me and my twisted imagination, but um, there's something about um, the four limbs. It is headless, but 
Um, this, this is a Mexican bouquet. Uh, inspiration. More flowers. I'm really interested in a kind of solidity and animation, and I'm not sure that's really what Soutine uh, is doing with his work. Um, but he's been part of my uh, revision of art history, let's say, for a long time. I see him as a pivotal kind of figure. Uh, I'm really interested in artists of the past that deal with extreme physicality with paint, like Chardon and uh, Courbet. Um, and also, what I feel Soutine does is he introduces an idea, um, well here, this is an incredible painting that's in the show that is, um, has this magical moment of illusion. It's wet, it's shiny, it's uh, iridescent, and it's just paint. And there's nothing that's worried about it. It's just laid down with incredible um, authority. And Soutine for me really is the bridge between the abstract expressionists who were uh, the artist of note when I was coming of age. And I think what he does is he presents an idea about time in that these paintings are happening before your very eyes. And I think the um, <clears throat> connection between the subject and the way they're painted is um, very profound. It really is an, an existential kind of question between what, what's, a lo what's life and what's death. And of course, um, uh, de Kooning made Soutine completely visible to me because I really am very fond of many things that um, de Kooning said. Um, that he was a slipping glimpser, um, which I think also applies to Soutine, this idea that it's a, an image that's in uh, a transitory state. Okay. <laughs> Hi, people. <laughs> um, Judith, you rock. I love you. Um, I will pick up on the time stuff that you're talking about and um, factor, and to a certain extent, that, God, what was it, slippery glim glimpsy? What Slip, slipping glimpses. Was, was slipping slip. glimpses. I'm like, mmm, slippery orifices, yummy. <laughs> um, Okay, so this is a detail that I shot in the show. Um, and um, I guess I'm gonna try and talk about, and I'll fail miserably, and I apologize for everything I'm about ready to say, but whatever. Um, um, the, um, I, I'm really struck by, by um, how Soutine actually uses still life as an interstitial kind of space. So the modernists used genres, whether it's portraiture or still life or landscape, not to perpetuate the ideologies of any of those things, but in fact, or the ideologies that latched onto those kinds of representations, but in fact to, I think, heighten the way themselves, but also their viewers could kind of metabolize the way we see things, the way we, the way we um, um, metabolize um, con constructs, uh, how we translate and metabolize objects and things in the world. And one of the ways that he has always struck me as an incredible painter is the way in which things that should be laminated to form, in fact, fuck off the form. They sort of float like 
um, like um, levitating um, separation. So there's a gap in the paintings between what it says it is and what it actually is. And what it actually is, is this mechanism for um, kind of radicalized um, comp contemplation of what we think is living or dead, to riff on what Judith <laughs> is saying, and what we actually know objects to be. And in that way, they fudge the ontology of what we think of as our experiences. And this is something that I'm incredibly interested in painters and in painting and in painters that I like. So this all facture of the light glistening on the, um, um, the manta ray, or what is the, the, it's not a manta ray, it's a ray fish. It's a ray, ray fish, yes. Um, that those marks do not in fact adhere to form, they levitate over them. That kind of displaced facture is something that I think is, 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 um, is really important that painting does that other people can't do. In that sense, it articulates um, a, the kind of sequence and the cadence of seeing, of the processes of seeing. Um, and of time. So the duration of the making and the duration of seeing and actually also the way in which external forces affect objects. And I think, if this button will work, I'm not sure why it's, oops. Um, it won't go forward for some reason. Oh, there it is, okay. I think that relates, in my, in my attachment to still life um, goes into cinema in many ways. So I'm gonna quote, I'm gonna try and imitate John Huston, so I, I apologize. Um, look at me. Look at the lamp. Look at me again. Now look at the lamp. Now look at me again. You see what you did? You blinked. <laughs> Those are cuts. That's the, your mind, now I can't imitate him anymore because now I have to explain what it is. But he did say at the end of it, behold, <laughs> which I like because in still life and in everything in painting when it's good, we're trying to behold something and we can't quite grasp it. It's like that slippery, slimy vagina fish. Oops, sorry. Um, <laughs> but, um, but this idea that in the, what he says, that's a pan, that's a cut. And that sense of we don't have to take the camera and move all the ways across the room and see every little bit. To a certain extent, we build narratives, we build ideas, we build systems of thinking by looking from one thing to another. And the idea happens in that space between those two things. So in that way, you could apply this idea that I'm thinking about to language, which is that words are one thing, but they mean nothing without the space between them. So it's the space between these undulating, oh, I can't get this thing to do anything I want it to do. Um, like seriously, okay. Between those, those dashes and the form they're supposed to be adhering to is what makes us see with, um, with our intellects, with our physiological um, intelligence and our philosophical intelligence at the same time. And that's what painting does. Um, so this is, on another note, this is my painting of Ben Gazaris, and I put it in there because there's a lamp. I'm obsessed with lamps, so I love that quote by John Huston. So this is the cut and this is the gap. So within every object here, there is an indexical association to how I translate the thing from what it actually is to what it actually is on the painting. So in that way, still life is an interstitial space where the viewer and the artist can have an indexical conversation about what it is that are, is all this crazy quotidian stuff that we surround ourselves with. Need I say, <laughs> late capitalist vomitude of hideous, useless objects too. <laughs> Did I say that? I don't even know what that meant. Um, anyway, so, um, so this is Ben Gazaris talking on the phone to Gina Rollins. Uh, from opening night. So I think about cinema as much as I think about painting often, and I still can't get this thing. I think I'm like too far away. Okay, so this is the pan. So I look at the ray fish, I look at the vase. And that space between, to a certain extent, we artists try to fill, and within that space that we try to fill is this delicious, absurd fiction of us trying to fill it, which we're trying to share robustly, lovingly, with the people who willingly look at paintings. 
And the, last night, my friend Jeff Chadzi, um, who is here um, and who I'm going to talk about, I wish this thing would work, um, said something to me which I thought aptly described painting. And um, trigger warnings. Um, it's called fupa. Does anybody know what fupa is? It's the fat upper pussy area. Or in other words, it's a muffin top. So it's the idea that you take all of these ideas and you try to cram them into a pair of jeans that are too small. <laughs> and then the stuff comes out the top. <laughs> right? But it's that self-deprecating, loving bit of flesh that's what we're trying to share here. And that is also an in-between. In other words, it's the space between what is quote unquote representation, which is a really boring word, and what the painting actually is. And that's how paintings communicate through the fupa. <laughs> so there's some fupa. That's the bunny. Um, uh, so the old, the old modernist proverb is, is it a bunny or is it a duck? Is it a duck or a bunny? It's a pipe. <laughs> it's a beheaded pipe. <laughs> so here you see also these wonderful all facture moments. I mean, these, these delightful floating white dashes that create the, either the feather or the light or the gleam on a body that should be shiny. All of the ontology of what this body is means um, means nothing of where it originated. And there's this beautiful, generous translation that is in that gap, which is the gap that we're actually doing and utilizing and exploiting as painters. Um, there it is. Oh, and this guy just put in, because it seemed like he could look at painting really well. <laughs> OK, so that's a painting I made. And it's a skull I found while I was fly fishing in a river in um, Vermont. And um, so uh, oftentimes I do performative things. It's still, I've tense, well, I don't even know where to begin. Because I, 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 years ago, and I think you might have been in the show, um, I curated a show at Manya Row called Available with Manya. And um, the idea was that we as artists need to use things that are available to the imaginations of our audience, but also to us, just like Judith and her, her um, beautiful um, tacky things. Um, and, it was as simple as that. And thinking, of course, about the kind of availability of the substance of, of, um, of um, I was going to say, uh, shit, now I'm, now I'm, I'm shooting too fast. Um, anyway, um, any kind of, whether it's Chardin or Alice Neal or, yes, so the list goes on. Um, and so the idea that we should use the stuff of the world to create this interstitial space is something I think that interests everybody in this room. Um, so uh, oftentimes when I'm doing something that's an actual action in my life, I, I do incorporate it into the studio. And I caught this fish. So actually, I caught it and I killed it. And then I painted it. So if I catch a fish and I keep it, I have to um, make a rendering of it as an as a homage. And then I gave this, by the way, to an auction for benefit of the Irene relief out at the Far Rockaways. Okay, so this is Courbet's, of course, we're all gonna talk about Courbet's. The thing that I love about this painting is that um, he, um, he um, wanted this fish to be alive, for there to be a sense that the mouth was moving. Um, it was after he had been in prison and was part of the Paris Commune, after, after being in prison for that, and was off in Switzerland for a while, and then he came back and he was making paintings of these fish that these these French fishermen were bringing in. And he wanted it to seem as though it was this object that was kind of caught between life and death, which just I'm just going to reiterate what um, Judith said in that. And obviously, Courbet thought about it too. Which I think this painting by Dave Humphrey also does. And also, speaking of all facture, like, what are those yellow blobs? And what is that red tongue oozing out of that truck? Which I imagine him making um, up uh, from a toy, but it could have been any number of things or an image. Available, meaning I think genres of landscape, portraiture, even classical narrative structures are available like still life to use, occupy, and, and incorporate and, uh, and, and elaborate upon. This is uh, Jeff Chadzi's um, 
drawing with, um, I don't even know, like apparatus, um, um, bana uh, quotidian um, armor and fashion stuff. And I don't even know where to begin. So again, I think he's literally throwing into relief how um, things get become simultaneous and stack up, except he's doing it through image on top of image rather than the kind of spatial articulation. Um, this is uh, Lavina Ellis. Um, I just love the way these, um, these figures are, are sort of like barely surviving the kind of um, explosion of what is supposed to embody them and, and fails to do so. But my, um, my f I wanted to talk about this person, Dawn Clements, who is an amazingly brilliant still life artist, and she has been, uh, not, she's not a still life artist, she's an artist who uses still life but also uses cinema in ways that I think connect to mine, and it has to do with pan, it has to do with duration, it has to do with space and object and this profound commitment to, uh, uh, um, to observing the quotidian in her sense and filling the gaps. In my sense, I'm more eloquent and I sort of leave the gaps open. Um, but I have gained every permission I can possibly gain as an artist from this person who is one of the most, I think, one of the most important artists working in the genre of still life today, if there is a such thing, um, and has thought through it um, and is willing to be vulnerable and dense and delicate and tasteless and generous in ways that I, I, don't, I don't perceive many other people having the courage to, to dare. Um, so this is a drawing she did at the Academy in Rome last year when I was teaching at RISD. Um, it's three tabletops, and I'm just going to pan through what she did on a daily basis, which also documents um, uh, she was going through a health treatment. So every day she would draw on this drawing and add to it. So that art, art literally embodies, articulates the pan. In other words, she's saying, I'm filling the gaps here, people. You want to come with me? It's one of the most amazing pieces I've seen in a million years. And I just felt as though Dawn needs to be brought up when anybody talks about still life these days. So that's why I'm doing this. OK, these are some of my new paintings. That's, I didn't give Dawn justice. Look at, that, look at this moment of like all the little bits she collected on the street in Rome and also the, the wrappers of the medication she was taking side by side. So this idea of things existing in latitude um, um, at a sort of merciless um, um, approximation to each other. Now, so this is, these are some of my new paintings that I think uh, throw around um, uh, this idea of emphasis and moving the viewer through the space of the painting. And I'm gonna just focus in on some of the moments which I think of as still life objects. And I think that I have sort of abandoned the logic of kind of pictorial space vis-a-vis -vis some of the ways in which I've learned to break up space from dawn. Yeah, that's Ozu, the Japanese filmmaker, on a pair of fishing waders. <laughs> Flip-flops. And that license might say 69, whatever. <laughs> that's uh, Gene Rollins, he's sort of teaching a lesson on Jack Smith. These are, this is seven by 11 foot painting. So all that off facture you can see I've been chewing and gnawing on Soutine and of course Enzo for my entire life. The G floating off there. Outward bound Gina Rollins. <laughs> and I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs> I'm Josephine Halverson. For some reason, I put my presentation in widescreen, so I'm now doing a separate presentation up here. Um, okay, should be good to go. Um, so I, first of all, I just want to say um, I'm so glad you brought up Dawn Clements. Um, her paintings, I completely agree. It's you know, to talk about still life without her work. Um, 
uh, would be somehow incomplete, and I think about her work all the time. Uh, I do think of myself as a still life painter, and, um, and this is what Google produces, or at least it did when I searched my name. And these are pictures of my work. Um, they are paintings of objects and surfaces that I come across. And um, I, uh, I should say that when, you know, the way, I, the way I've come to think of my work is uh, through a practice that I've developed which generates paintings. Um, and the practice is, uh, is one of working outside in the tradition of plein air painting. So I'm kind of like a still life painter who makes paintings outside um, in the kind of landscape tradition. But there are kind of portraits of things that I encounter as well. But I think about genre all the time, and, uh, and specifically these overlapping genres of, say, say, still life and landscape and portraiture. And by the way, this is a screenshot from my computer of I take these photographs when I make, um, when I make paintings um, that document my experience. And, um, and, you know, setting up an easel, making a painting outside. And by the way, I should say that, um, you know, the, the practice is one of kind of traveling around, wandering around, meandering, encountering something, and not really knowing why or exactly um, what it is that I'm doing, but just wanting to, having, having a kind of hunch or an impulse that I want to make a painting out of that encounter. And, um, and it's pretty straightforward. It's just like you'd picture. It's pretty basic. Just set up an easel, make a painting of something, and it kind of looks like it, too. Um, and that's about it. <laughs> so I could sit down, but it is uh, <laughs> it's something that um, it's been like an extremely generative practice of getting to know things in the world. And kind of like in the introduction that Jenna read, I think of it as a way of kind of understanding something else in the world. And it, it is maybe in that sense a little philosophical. And, um, and I also really love this kind of experiential way of working, of encountering something um, and being in the presence of it. Something that with Soutine's work I'm always struck by is the, is the kind of like, for instance, in the show downstairs, the smell of the meat that he must have, um, and the flesh that was rotting that he must have had to contend with. Um, same with other still life painters like Chardin, um, for instance, always painting in a kind of cold room, so the the meat was um, you know preserved longer, and he had more time to paint it. I was struck by the wall text downstairs that you know that there was this carcass that Soutine kept dousing in blood with um, just to keep it looking fresh, um, <laughs> and uh, and and for me um, that kind of encounter with something real is is very central to what I do um, so anyway so but in terms of motif um, even though it is still life I I never set out to paint any kind of set um, kind of theme or uh, range of motif in my work but it has emerged over time so for instance like just in this cross section which comes up on Google um, they, you know, they're like flat things, vertical things, faces, old things, um, wooden things, painted things, um, rectangular things. Uh, I don't really know why that is, but I've thought a lot about it. But those are some of the kind of, um, you know, subjects that I've, that I've painted over the years. And, um, and here you can see, um, you know, again, some more doc you know, random kind of smattering of, of documentation images of, uh, of working um, and, uh, and, and in ma making work this way, of course it's painting, of course it's still life, but it's also allowed me to connect with other traditions like photography, which also requires a being there on location um, uh, and um, uh, even kind of documentary traditions and other things outside of art, like American history um, or psychogeography, traditions that, are, um, that have to do with a certain kind of understanding of locale and place. So here's a close-up of a painting I made, maybe close to 10 years ago now, just to show you, you know, the, you know, the, the setup. 
And um, here's another one. This was also probably about, about a decade ago as well. And, um, and I have to say that um, you know, during this time, there have been, as I mentioned, a number of motifs that have emerged of things I paint, like um, signs or um, gravestones. I really love uh, gravestones. And to pick up on the theme that Judith and Angela talked about, which is actually exactly how I think about still life, um, which is this space between kind of something that's alive and something that's dead. And uh, I think that that's pretty much painting as well. It can be what painting is. It feels very, it can feel very alive and fresh. I remember one time I saw a Chardin painting. I think it was at the Art Institute of Chicago. And it was as if he had just left the room, maybe like um, 20 minutes beforehand. And it's crazy to think. I mean, it was probably three, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, 250 years beforehand. Um, so that sense that something contains the trace of, of what I call, what I think of as maybe liveliness, something that is like kind of alive, but, but it can't possibly be alive, um, is, uh, is something that I think about all the time. And um, this painting, for instance, uh, is called Memento Mori, which you know, translates to remember that you're mortal. And um, I, you know, even in the kind of terminology of still life, of um, dead nature or um, silent life, um, Stillleben or um, Natumach, these French and German terms, or um, even, even still life in English is like a kind of an oxymoron, something which is both alive and, and not at the same time. And I think of these kinds of like, you know, say in this painting, this um, industrial, forgotten about kind of um, uh, you know, piece of equipment that, has, that bears the kind of traces of having had a life that is still, it's still existing, but um, it contains a certain kind of residue on it. And I like that in a trace that there was some life to it. This was something that I started picking up on the more I was developing this practice of wandering around and if something kind of felt like it called out to me or it spoke to me or it made eye contact with me in some way. It felt like it was asking to be painted or it was alive in some way. And so for there was a time when I was painting things which um, seemed to also possess these human characteristics like eyes or faces, um, things that felt kind of alive to me. In reality, this was part of a machine that pulled um, redwood trees out of the forest in Northern California but it seemed to have an expression to it. And, um, and so, uh, th in fact, I had a show, this is a, um, uh, an installation photograph from an exhibition at Sycamore and Jenkins in 2011, and the show was called What Looks Back, and it was things that, I, that I'd encountered that seemed to return uh, a look that I had um, to them. And I think similarly, you know, with, with a lot of still life, but for instance, specifically with Soutine downstairs, there's a sense that these animals or these objects um, were aware of his own um, encounter with them, uh, that their spirit or um, something to them was more than what they were. So I was interested in this myself, and, um, and I was getting increasingly um, curious about what defined liveliness or what made something feel alive, and why, if that was the thing that I really wanted to paint. And so I had the opportunity to paint in a slaughterhouse. Um, and uh, this is the only time I've done it. Um, and it happened to be in Iceland where I guess, you know, they don't mind having an oil painter in the, <laughs> in, in the freezer. So, um, so I was able to um, paint this. I, actually, I, was, I came the day before and I, I saw the, um, uh, I did not actually witness the, the moment of um, slaughter. Uh, that was my choice. Um, I do eat meat, uh, and I should have seen that, but I, I didn't. Um, but to see them alive, and then moments later to see them as as carcasses, and um, and just really out of curiosity, like whether um, whether it was different painting something that I had known factually had been alive, um, and honestly. It didn't matter. Um, it just felt like any other object, which I, you know, then had to contend with that 
eventuality. By the way, there's a photograph of me and the, the <laughs> slaughterhouse owner. And I had, to, um, you can't really see it, but I had two Icelandic sweaters on underneath that um, <laughs> attractive getup. Um, <laughs> I had to wear a hairnet and everything. Um, but anyway, that's my painting of that. So, so afterwards, and encountering uh, actually things about my own, um, my own mortality um, and my own health, uh, uh, maybe not unlike Dawn's um, still life, for instance, um, I was starting to think about um, the way in which objects and surfaces can, can actually um, uh, can become, uh, can, can contain this um, in, in durability to them or something uh, as a, or something that would maybe exceed my own lifetime or, um, and I think that this preoccupation with mortality is also something that's very central to still life, um, a kind of, you know, hyper awareness of the, of the, of like a lifespan. Um, and that's never more evident than I think in the work downstairs. And, um, and I'll end, um, I'll end on some more recent work. Um, you know, uh, and there were, by the way, between what looks back and what I'm showing here, there were several bodies of work that had to do with kind of, um, you know, again, these same questions of liveliness and am I giving life to this object? Is it giving life to me? How are we, how is our own liveliness kind of combining and meshing to make this um, almost a certain kind of like uh, lived record or, a, or an emulsion of our own, um, our own vitality, really, and how does that get translated into this kind of, in this mediumistic way through painting, in this real-time experience. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the kind of, that, that's the thing that made me want to make paintings. Um, yes, they do result in, you know, certain nameable objects, like a chalkboard, um, or, you know, shutters or something, and, and that is true as well, but the thing that made me really want to make has made me want to make all these paintings all this time is to kind of sense that that um, the spirit in something or the kind of life in something and try to understand how that can be translated through this mediumistic process of painting and I, I think we all you know we can all see that whether it's a representation of an actual lived creature or not so in, um, in this kind of more recent body of work, which um, was uh, exhibited last fall um, uh, here in New York um, at Sikkim and Jenkins, this, these were paintings that represented a, um, a kind of boundaries in land, um, markers, things which kind of uh, traced the um, uh, ownership and kind of claims o over land, but also natural reclamations and um, more evidence of people, but also of time and and um, uncanny things that would that would happen, which um, occur in my practice too. Things which give you a sense that someone was there, or there was there is a a certain kind of um, uh, something, some some energy or whatever that's you know this is where I start to kind of go off. So I'm not going to go there, but um, but you know that it is manifest in the in the world we look at and all the things kind of like what Angela was saying earlier. Like how do we deal with all this stuff that's around us and it does possess a lot of, um, if you start looking, you know, it can be really overwhelming how much every object contains and whether it's its history, it's, um, it's the kind of residue that I'm talking about of, of its witnessing, um, its manufacture, its um, function in the world. It's really every single object is so loaded, so full. Um, how to kind of tap into that uh, is something that I think still life and particularly I think painting uh, really can do very well. So these are some of those paintings. Um, and also moving from this kind of vertical object as in many of the paintings I've shown you to actually to the, um, to the, to a horizontal one is something that's come a little more recently to me. Um, so for instance, like in Dawn's painting of the tabletop or many of the work downstairs, I was, I was looking at it in terms of like the hanging, uh, stretched almost carcasses. And then, and then occasionally there'd be like a duck um, on, a, on a table, you know, in Soutine's work. So this, um, uh, when we think about still life, it tends to be kind of handheld objects that sit on a table. 
But um, I'm actually coming to that a little bit late, and, and, in, and what I'm doing is thinking about it in terms of the ground. And, um, and I'm including the last images I have here are of the, of, um, the ground, uh, because also they're in an exhibition that opens tonight um, at Peter Bloom. So if you want to see them in person, um, it's up for, for a little while. And these are gouache paintings on paper, um, and they were made in the desert where objects don't really deteriorate that quickly and they kind of stay there. Um, and it's a place I've returned to uh, repeatedly to paint and kind of almost chart its evolution and my evolution through, through looking at it as well. Um, so that's where I'll end. Thanks. I'm going to ask you if you guys thought about Satine, but I'm, obviously I don't have to ask that question. <laughs> All right, I'm actually going to start, uh, I'll go this way, I guess, and then, because I want to read this quote from uh, De Willem de Kooning that seems relevant. <clears throat> Some painters, including myself, do not care what chair they're sitting on. It does not even have to be a comfortable one. They're too nervous to find out where they ought to sit. They don't want to sit in style. And one of the reasons I bring this up is because of the food that Soutine depicts as non-kosher and would be at odds with the di dietary restrictions of his Jewish upbringing. So are there subjects that you seek out because they make you uncomfortable? And what role does discomfort play in your work? Okay. <laughs> um, I always feel as though the objects that I choose to spend time with and paint have some meaning that I am looking for and haven't found yet. And when it gets transformed into a painting, it becomes clearer. So it's part of a process. Um, but the idea of taste uh, or lack of a taste is something that I've thought about constantly. Um, and well, you're in the bad painting show. So oh, right. That right. Uh, I mean, that's when I first saw your work. Uh, yes, that's been quite a uh, misunderstood. Uh, title for a show. And it, uh, in the immediate <laughs> aftermath of that, um, I got a review that said, yeah, bad, man, you should see this work. It's really <laughs> bad. And these people really can't draw. Uh, so I don't know, people are dying to be told what to think. And I guess they thought <laughs> saying it's bad <laughs> cleared up all thought on that subject. Um, <laughs> So, um, but I've always uh, thought about art and taste, and I guess uh, when you're very young and you're becoming an artist and the idea that uh, art has to do with beauty uh, in the beginning, um, what, you get over that. <laughs> And uh, I think it's more the mystery and the history and the potential uh, to have a transcendent meaning um, kind of guide me in my uh, taste of, of objects, uh, what I want to spend time with. Um, what about you, Angela? Oh, boy. Um, I mean, it's funny. I'll show you. I mean, yes. well, I, I'll get to that question next. Okay. I mean, I guess people would, those of you who are unfortunate enough to know my work, um, they, they um, you might think that I was going out seeking, you know, that uncomfortable chair, as de Kooning describes, like, uh, or in some way trying to transgress or be, or be um, problematic, whatever it is. And, um, and, you know, I was ob obviously, I don't know why that would be obvious, really raised like a Catholic you know, confirmed Catholic, lower middle class kid. 
Um, and so, you know, like artists like Mike Kelly, or it, it, I needed to get out of the repressive, oppressive, heteronormative, imaginative confines, you know, as an artist. But the, the really embarrassing part is I never tried to be naughty or whatever. I just am trying to unhinge my imagination from the, those that will contain it. So there's, to a certain extent, if I take on an object or an image, it's exactly as Judith describes it. It's like you, it's a, it is a, a, an exploration, it's a journey, it's a, it's a voyage through that image in translation. And good artists are really good at watching themselves translate things, and they do not abide by style. They do not figure out methodological ways of making things. They're always attuned to that mystery in the finding of the thing. And for me, I'm kind of a whore for narrative. I wouldn't say I'm plot driven, <laughs> driven but because um, I actually I, I do not have clear narratives in my pictures. They are found through the sauce, as it were. Um, and then the narratives may kind of happen, and there are recurring themes. But they're themes that I need to survive. So, what about that pain? I don't. Where you have that I don't want to make it up. You know, I, I'm not trying to be. I. It's just that. The image does something to me, and it's a call and response. And then I unhinge my imagination by the things I'm able to say with the paintings, and I use them for that. So I guess I'm a surrealist in some tedious way. What were I you going to say? I never thought of you as a surrealist. I'm not. But you know, they would do that, you know, the Rorschach or whatever. Why yeah, do you yeah, see yeah, there, that, right? Yeah, it yeah. kind of works like that. And yeah. you also bring in all this information, like the Ozu and then Gina Rollins and all this stuff that it's like, what do you do with all the stuff in your head, right? You gotta put it somewhere. I mean, the poor people that have to live around me all the time. I need to <laughs> shut up. Um, no, the, um, the um, you know, I mean, I really believe, I get, believe is a terrifying word, especially in these days. I mean, how many times do you all throw up in your mouth with the political climate happening every day here? Let's face it, we're all ad nauseum. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, Th this, this sense of like, I don't know. Uh, I don't, yeah. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll go to Josephine. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know, I mean, I think like making, um, I would say that the discomfort for me is maybe more in the, in the practice um, in that there's a kind of physical discomfort to being outside a lot of the time. Um, that has to do with like basic human needs. Uh, and that can be, I, I don't know, I mean, I, it feels um, uh, uncomfortable in that sense. Um, but it always seems to be a test of my attention and interest in what I'm doing and kind of motivation. Um, I think a lot about aversion uh, therapy. We were talking earlier, I hate packing, which is ironic because I'm constantly packing and moving around and not just in my practice but in my life as well, um, which is maybe why I don't enjoy it. But there's, it's, there's something funny about like really gravitating towards the things that you just can't stand. I mean, I'm very organized and yet um, the, the kind of constant packing, unpacking is just, it, it drives me crazy. So there's a way in which that is true. I also think a lot about maps and um, in my more recent work of kind of like the, the realm of mapping um, uh, over this canvas where your attention lies and where it recedes and what is a point of interest and what isn't. And, um, and then of course like the, the geography of a certain kind of itinerant practice. There are times that I get myself into places and interest in things that I'm not sure, you know, for instance, the slaughterhouse, um, that's maybe an extreme example, but there are other kind of more psychic spaces that are, you know, that are full of discomfort. And I wonder what that, that sense of escape is um, and, um, and probably has to do with avoiding um, uh, or, um, I don't know, it, it's, you know, I'm in therapy. 
<laughs> You're in therapy? Oh, join the club. <laughs> um, what, what do the, all of you, I, I've written about all three of you, your work more than once, I believe, in each case. And I'm always interested in the way you put the paint down. And, how, and so I just thought I'd ask a dumb question so the next time I write about you, I'll know what to say. Uh, is what, what do you think about the relationship between paints, materiality, and the subjects you choose? I think about this a lot. Um, I mean, for me, as I mentioned, the kind of, when I refer to the mediumistic quality of, um, of paint, that is, that it is like a, it is some kind of connective tissue between me and something else. And it does feel like what, at the best of times, if I make a brush stroke, um, as I'm sure many of you have, um, if not all of you in this room at one point or another, and you make this stroke um, onto a surface, it can kind of become something more than it should become. And I think that when, you know, like in Soutine's paintings downstairs, when he, he might paint um, uh, like the, um, maybe say like the neck of one of those fowl, uh, and it is, it describes the neck, but it describes so much more than that. And I liked that quote, um, which was downstairs, um, where Soutin said something like, for Courbet, he wanted to paint all of the women in Paris. Um, but for himself, what, what did he say? Do you remember this quote? <laughs> I wrote it down, um, or I took a picture. He wanted Does to anyone paint all remember those this? Strong necks. <laughs> all those That's. That's right. And, and I think that, that is, that's something where I feel like it, it can only happen through the materiality of paint. If he were to just contemplate the, um, the carcass, uh, I don't think that he could find all so much more than, than the sum of the parts. It comes through the act of painting. And I think a particular kind of factor that Soutine has, which has to do with, again, what he pays attention to, what he doesn't, and what, um, what ends up being kind of um, you know, expressed through this um, mediumistic um, substance, this weird kind of gooey thing that has a color, is really extraordinary. And I think at the best of times for myself, like when I lay down a stroke, and it feels like so much more than what it should do. Um, and it does, it doesn't determine my subjects, but it determines how I approach what it is I'm looking at. Okay, Angela, step to the plate. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> I'll try and write it in. Um, so, so, yeah, the all factor. I mean, I think I kind of talked about this when I was talking before. This, um, this, this, I, I think, maybe I'm a Brechtian, that there should be a healthy, di I definitely have the hangover of Brecht, the, 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 um, the sense that the, the, um, that, the, that the mark should, to a certain extent, not express but articulate what the thing is and it should communicate. But that it should not in any kind of, without irony, it should not seduce into the luxury of the, of the retinol. Now I'm sounding like Greenberg or something. Of that thing. Yeah, I know. I understand what you're saying. And 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 I think and I think it's the separation between the the mark and the subject matter. That's the that's the in between space that that actually is why people can't stop painting. Why why it still becomes a kind of viable, uh, uh, necessary way of maybe I, I kind of think contemplating the world through an active an act. Um, but I also think it can, it, it can do, like in Dawn's case, it can, it, it, and I hope in my case, and certainly in Soutain's, certainly in these women, um, it, can, um, it can express the kind of duration of thought as things accumulate, of accumulation, of accumulation of experiences that, that means that it's a truly a temporal way of observing, you know, and um, that's um, that's an incredibly 
annoying, impossible thing to achieve in any way that, that expands the meaning of things. So mm -hmm. in that way, elaborating on like, oh yeah, the forces that create this, there's weird light, it's dark, it's, you know, it's humid, it smells like shit. This person, you know, or the sauce of the genre could be in all of these different temperate situations. So it could be sexy, it could be adoring, it could be filled with piss and vinegar. And this is something that we do as artists. We want to share these experiences with people. We actually never do it with images or representation. We do it with, I think Mira Shore called it the ooze. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Um, I started out as an abstract painter, so my concentration on paint kind of started there without it being a thing, but just paint. And the making the paint specific within the rectangle uh, has always been on my mind. And that sort of conflict between the paint and the form that it can represent and what it actually is supposed to represent is uh, is a challenge. Um, and I really looked, that's this one thing that I really looked at Soutine very carefully for, and I was really surprised. I couldn't figure out what kind of brushes he was using. Oh, <laughs> and he was obsessed. how, I mean, I was thinking, is it a Sumi brush that he boiled? <laughs> and did he load it up with paint and then he made it represent these feathers? Mm -hmm. um, he was, uh, seemed to be very preoccupied with some kind of equation between illusion and the actual uh, physicality of the paint. And he was obsessed with brushes. I mean, he was constantly toting around like 40, 50 brushes. That's, it was not, he wasn't an expressionist in that way, like I'm gonna go at this painting right, hand. Right. Uh, yeah. He was precise, he was rigorous. Yes, that was the, what's so surprising is the, is the precision. And there was some echoes of what de Kooning does too, who I know he boiled his brushes, where you've got a big slab of paint and you're so aware that you're applying it to the physical surface of the paint but it feels like sagging flesh, mm -hmm. and it's hanging there in space. So it's sort of like a dance with the brush or the tools. Um, yeah. The one thing I noticed in all of you were, when you were talking was you're all thinking about mortality as artists, which seems certainly to be a preoccupation of Soutine. And I mean, I often thought that, um, so I'm a poet and, and I love the fact that I can sit in my room for hours and fiddle around with words as the best way to pass time. Um, and um, I think of artists in a similar way, it's like how you shape the way you live in time and go through the day. And at the end of the day, perhaps you even have something that you did. I mean. All poets are jealous of artists because they go to the studio and go, look at all that stuff on the wall. Mine's just in a drawer somewhere. <laughs> or in my case, on a computer that might collapse one day. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? So there is this kind of shaping of time as you go through it and all of you talk about duration. You talk about time because you're really conscious of its passing and kind of unconscious when you're painting in a way, I think, if that makes some kind of sense. Does that make sense? Am I, have I gone off the deep end now? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think about that, ladies? <laughs> I can't believe I used that word. <laughs> ladies. I, I love I love when I, I I should also say that many most of my work is made over the course of a day and just kind of dawn till dusk and just being there and making the most of my day and you know at the end of the day it if it doesn't work out I've had a great day and you know there's always tomorrow and if it does work out then 
there's a great day and there's always tomorrow. So <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's a way of, of also like choosing how I shape my time and how I um, also to make a day memorable and how to, I think, um, memorialize it. it. As you say, this kind of like evidence of, of your time, but specifically within maybe this relates to facture as well or the kind of way that paint appears and is applied. Um, for me, it feels like a kind of catching up to time, like at the best, you know, in the best case scenario, like no second is passed without my noticing. And in that sense, for a brief span, you know, of, of say however many hours, and it doesn't happen every second of every minute of every hour, but there is a sense that like nothing is passing me by. And I feel really alive when that is the case. And, it, and in, for me, it's only ever happened through painting. Um, and, uh, and it's so exhilarating. And it feels like I'm just, um, yeah, like I have a certain kind of agency of, of my own vitality um, that has nothing to do with the finished painting, but it has to do with the, um, the process of painting and is, um, is something that I, you know, I just live for. Literally. No, I understand. <laughs> oh my God. Um, <laughs> yes, I love death metal. Um, it actually, is. True. I know we've heard you sing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what can I say? Um, that we're we're these are all just like that we're conjuring spells to survive this 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 experience. This is a very distinctly modern syndrome of like basically calling painting this this hyper presence like right it's we're talking loosely but hopefully not like Richard Geary like about meditation or something right, right? Right, this right. is not like some kind of <clears throat> Buddhist you know party we're having here because it mostly sucks most of the time you know it's like oh my god like did I really <laughs> do that like <laughs> Is somebody come, gonna come in the room and like hit me in the head with something? Because I'm completely out of my mind. Um, so, so this, so this, um, so this sense of trying to share that radical sense of presence that she's talking about, where a hundred percent of you is concentrated on the act of translation. I, I keep bringing up this act of translation because it it doesn't necessarily adhere to a rendering of an object, but it could. It could be de Kooning slathering the, 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 the gobs, the flesh that, that she was talking about, or the, or the um, you know, the observing of the, the, the Iceland. Oh my God, you gotta paint those tomatoes that they grow in Iceland. Anyway, um, <laughs> those tomato things are so cool. Um, this, this sense of like, bear, of witnessing something and that witness happens in the present moment, but it also happens in analyzing this other thing, which is like what you're feeling and how interpretation and panic and rage and things contribute to that perception without letting it cloud the perception to where there is not, to where it becomes this preachy, um, you know, like, oh, life is horrible and we're all dying, and this is this goth party, but rather like, death is this thing, you know, people commit suicide, people drink too much, people get dementia and you can't talk to them anymore, you know? And then how do you talk? Right. And, and we're very fortunate to be modern people who aren't like making pictures for ideological regimes saying, you know, like let's tell the story about how we climbed over this mountain and how badass we were and how we, you know, beat up the brown and black people. So yeah. that's just something where we get to contemplate our mortality and I think we should understand that we're incredibly lucky to be doing this. And to a certain extent, we should pound our fists on the table and say, this is what we should be doing. <laughs> we have enough money and enough resources and enough yummy stuff and like wine, which I need, to like get through. Anyway, that's my point. Aye. <laughs> um, well, um, 
I really liked what Josephine said about spending your time in the studio and how it does keep your mind out of the gutter and dark places. <laughs> and it does really make you feel alive, um, as opposed to not alive. Um, I don't know, I've always seen uh, the subject of death in life, it's the curse of being human, that somewhere you know there's going to be an end to this. <laughs> And you spend a lot of your time trying to avoid that thought. <laughs> and I think, uh, the, uh, like both of you were saying, this ability to concentrate and be present is an incredible gift. Um, so in a roundabout way, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I understand that notion of concentrating is being a gift because you know, I understand that. Because I, I don't disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. The other thing that I was thinking about is that Soutine, I mean, Greenberg sort of rejected Soutine's work because he, quote, said it lacked structure and didn't have anything to do with cubism and obviously didn't have anything to do with impressionism. He rejected it because of its relationship to old masters and literary qualities. Um, and yet, I would say that all three of you do those things that, you know, in a way you think about old masters. You think about, I mean, uh, some of you have even cited paintings, uh, thinking of uh, Angela citing Corbet, but completely redoing the studio, Corbet in a studio. And then you also have like literary things like film references, allusions. And so in a way it's like, and I was thinking of this other thing, it's like you're carrying a lot of painting in your head and you're having a conversation with it even as you're painting whatever it is you're painting, right? Is that a fair thing to say? Yep. I mean, yeah, I try to share that out loud in every painting. I mean, well, yeah, but yeah, of course. So in that way, Soutine would be, say, more important to you than a lot of other artists in that regard, or other artists that you, I mean, the artists talking to other artists publicly, you know, like, say, the Courbet painting. I'm well, this thinking. is the, but this is the flip side of the modern thing, right? Right. It's like that, which is not a bad thing, but to a certain extent, you know, we all know that Greenberg drew a line in the sand to kind of perpetuate this idea of American painting, which is right. awesome. Right. But at a certain point, we're past that now. So right. like I can think about Joan Mitchell and right. Bonard and right. El Greco right. <laughs> over lunch. Yeah. If I take time to have lunch. Right. You know, and that's, that's um, you know, of course, that's the information age we're in. But it's also the fact that, you know, which allows us to think about history in like radically nonlinear ways. Like we don't have to say, you know, we are innovating this place in painting and it's gonna be the next great thing. Rather, we're using painting really as a communication tool, again, in a way that I think is more similar to 19th century modes of communication. And that, that but without the, uh, but yet we're working independently, right? right we're not working for Napoleon III right, right. Or, the, or the Duchess of blah, blah. Right. We kind of are sometimes, but I try not to, yeah. That's another statement altogether, but yeah. I'm trying to think of what Duchess you're working No, with. I'm not working. I'm just saying there's a lot of people that buy lots of art that might think that they're Duchess. <laughs> and what about you? I mean, both of you probably uh, think of a lot um, of artists. I th uh, think a lot about the contrast between Pollock and de Kooning. And I've always, I greatly, greatly admire Pollock's contribution, and he did kind of slither out of all of the history of Western art and the drawing of a, of a form and just went for it. And I loved the downtown show that was, um, that was up, a great show. Uh, yeah. last year because it really did 
present this moment uh, where you just throw it at the wall and you see if it sticks. sticks right. And it's so brave and it's so out there. Uh, but I've actually always been more on de Kooning's wavelength. Um, and then you do have to honor all your uh, um, artistic relatives. I mean, every painting you paint is really seen on the backdrop of every other painting made. So, it's a it's a burden. Um, yeah, but it's like. But it's you, a resource. But if you're a cook, you need to know how to make stock. You need to know how to chiffonage. You need to know how to like when to buy which you know ramps or or good fresh onions. Like you need to be versed in the syntax of your medium. If you're a basketball player, you have to have like a hook shot and you have to play defense. <laughs> you know. And that's, that's, that, that's to a certain extent, that's at least half of what it means to be a painter is to like research painting. And, and some people didn't have the, the um, opportunity mm -hmm. to research like the way we do now. And so to pick up on your, you know, uh, the kind of making the most of our historical moment right now, being able to do that um, is is a gift. And just last week, I was in Naples, Italy, looking at um, the still life frescoes from Pompeii, and thinking what a shame it was that those hadn't been excavated in time for Chardin to see them. <clears throat> and then you look downstairs at um, at Soutin, who who clearly saw the Chardin Ray, and we get to see, um, you know, both of those. I've seen um, the Chardin Ray several times, and I don't know, thinking about like the, how important it is to, to go places and really look at art in person, so we do understand this kind of ancestral family tree in some, in some way that we have the option to do, which is, um, which is an extraordinary moment. Um, I also, in my own personal work, I couldn't help but think about, um, in my interests, which, uh, which center um, largely around, around still life, but also other more minor um, kind of painting traditions in America, like Ashcan School, for instance, um, or American, 19th century American still life, and thinking about like John Sloan, um, and what did he, you know, he was roughly con contemporaries with Soutine, right? right. Um, or um, Robert Henry, or even when you showed the fish, I was thinking about William Merritt Chase's um, fish. And, um, and those, those uh, um, American traditions that are maybe, maybe lesser known um, pre-war that speak to, um, I, th I think speak to the show downstairs and, you know, in really powerful ways too. Yeah, I mean, I think that is true that you can't, that this, in this particular moment, you have access to much more stuff than, I mean, even just terms of like, if I want to find out about a poet, I just go to my computer and suddenly, you know, 20 poems pop up that I might not otherwise be able to f have found 20 years ago. And it's really kind of amazing because in a way it's a burden, but it's also like a total exhilaration because you think, oh, I could steal from this person. <laughs> and I could steal from that person. Now I have yes. 500 people to steal from. <laughs> it's like being let loose in the candy store, right? I mean, in a way. So, um, Lee, what you're talking about, a fundamental act of human development. Like, we poach, we start by poaching from our parents and we just move forward. Like, and so to a certain extent, this, you know, this, it's why people like art so much, because it's like, when, when you see whatever Caravaggio riff on somebody or you see Soutine citing Chardin like that, you're like, oh, there's a larger constellation than just like me. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is bigger than me, you know? So um, should we open up the questions to the... Yeah, let's do it. Oh my God, the on, public. Maybe. Microphones. Yeah, okay, we're running a little long, so maybe we just like one or two or three, but I saw one hand, so if you have a question, just raise your hand. Oh, I'm sorry that we're running too long. I love to talk, can you tell? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, the Sotine paintings to my 
non-educated eyes of recent uh, artworks. Excuse me, I didn't hear the question. My eyes of uneducated uh, uh, being of uh, recent art history seem very uh, animalistic, very uh, slaughterhouse, and I was wondering why some of you are painting things that are so industrial without that slaughterhouse that Sartini is so vivid about. They're all vegans. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hell no. <laughs> no. Industrial. Yeah. I don't know, that's interesting. Like, the kind of remove that everything has. I mean, when, when I guess we have more like farm to table kind of options right now, but by and large, there seems to be certainly, you know, my my life experience like quite a remove from from like the 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 uh, the slaughtered animal, and um, and I think that looking for I I certainly know for myself looking for the traces of where things have happened, um, looking for the evidence, which has been you know really obstinately removed from view and um, but trying to kind of sniff out the margins and the edges of how what makes the world the world that we live in and um, like I said during my talk I eat plenty of meat and I've never killed an animal um, uh, myself personally or or even witnessed it so it's um, there are there's a certain kind of like proximity that Soutine really had your right that is that I you know, that I feel, you know, I think is very powerful and something um, is a really important reminder of kind of being aware of, um, of, yeah, of just the kind of everyday, I mean, we talk about the quotidian and the everyday object, but like if you're eating meat every day, um, you know, why is there that remove? And Soutine reminds us that you can actually get c quite close to it. And then there's that wonderful painting that you did with the person holding the head. Do you remember that? Me? You. That was <laughs> oh, pretty yes. slaughterhouse yes. to me. Yeah. I love I mean, that painting. I mean, it's like slaughterhouse and also like video drone or something. Yeah, yeah. decapitation, I mean. I mean, I have killed chickens and fish. And, and obviously you killed yeah. fish and you just painted the and fish And I do you try to get to bridge that. I don't always do it in my paintings, but, but I also, I paint from life almost as frequently as I do I, whatever you would call the other paintings allegorically, in a way. Um, and I mean that in the, like, like really the modern way of, like, mm -hmm. allegory. Um, but, um, but uh, and there is a sense of, like, trying to dissolve uh, uh, the distance um, between things, between points, whether it's two people or, um, you know, there's a painting I did where there's a friend that I was painting from life and we were talking about Santeria and her, she's Puerto Rican and um, she's Maritza Renero, she's a badass, um, amazing artist. And, um, and she was like, I want something, and I take prompts from people, so she's like, I want something dangling next to me and I just started slashing things around. It was like, it brought me back to flaying a chicken at some point and I was like, I know that, now how do I, share that knowledge in the painting. And like, how can I push, you know, in, into that, in, into the graphic of that? I, 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 but I don't, I don't know, um, you know, this brings me up to like, I've been watching my clock wondering when the, speaking of allegory, when the Suko retrospective is gonna happen. Like, I feel like it's gonna happen like any minute, you know, in her work that was very, very profound oh, about against, the pigs. About, just about industrial meat production. Pig, right. I mean, this is an artist who, like, she has single-handedly, like, with so much anger and passion and intelligence, gone after this subject. Right. You know, I mean, it, it happens. I wouldn't say that my subject is, is that per se. There's another, this is something else on the side. I, I, don't, I don't know if that would hold me. Right. I do. I am such an omnivore. <laughs> Anyone else? <Thank> you. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking carnivore and omnivore sort of oh. go together. 
Hmm. Hi, uh, this is kind of an annoyingly broad question, but I was wondering if you could sort of talk about your relationship to drawing, about whether or not you keep a sketchbook or you sketch out your paintings beforehand. You, you guys are obviously all painters, so I'm just wondering about the, that sort of aspect of your practice. I draw a lot, but sometimes I don't. And they're really great. <laughs> In case you're wondering. Okay. I don't know if you draw. Oh, I do. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I do. Now I've learned something new. <laughs> and you? Do you draw? Um, not as much as I should, probably. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I do draw. Um, and I do keep a sketchbook, actually. I keep a lot of them. Um, they're more notes and sometimes sketches as well. But um, come to think of it, I yeah, I draw and keep a keep a sketchbook um, all the time. Because I, I think drawing is sort of not shown that much. It's sort of disrespected. Because as Paul Cummings, the curator at the Whitney, once said to me. You can't lie in drawing. Oh, I think you can. I know, but... <laughs> I think you can lie anywhere, anytime. <laughs> I was too young to tell him that. <laughs> he but I do like that kid. idea. It does seem more bare bones. But, yeah. And for me, you know, like, I use it really... Uh, nobody would ever think I would talk about this, but I always bring up Mel Bachner when I think about drawing, which nobody would be, oh yeah, Angela Dufresne's up there talking about Mel Bachner. Surprise! Um, I'm surprised. But, but he just said that drawing was a space, but all your work should be this. But he used, he really just framed drawing as the space where you test what is possible. And in that way, that's why Josephine writing notes in her, that, the, 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 the exploration is happening. It's like drawing is really, is, could be very, very different things. It could be taking photographs. Right. Um, I actually am the least censored, which is a state that is part of my 100% present-ness, um, um, when I'm just drawing with the quickest dumbest material like charcoal on paper. So I, I do that when, when, not even when I'm stuck or when I you know, need to come up with new ideas. It's, I mean, it's, it's just a way of warming up and it's a way of constantly doubting that I know who I am. And, it, and it's, it's, so who knows what, how that looks, but I do it in the most conventional obvious way possible because it's easy that way should we have one more question and then go off and eat our kosher meal <laughs> oh my god was there a hand up I didn't see the hand no hands okay <laughs> thank you all so much and thank you everyone for coming